Patrick, in trying to understand free will and what the brain does and what our inner urges are, the timing is so critical. What are some of the key experiments in letting us understand the relationship between brain events and our sense of free will? Right. I'd like to take, tell you about some work. It's not my own experimental work, but some very special studies um, by Itzhak Fried, which were published back in 1991, where he had the very rare ability to actually control the input to volition. Mm. So one of the reasons why volition is really hard to study scientifically is we have to ask the person to do something. <laughs> we can't control the input. But there are very few cases where you can control the input, and they are scientifically extremely informative. So in some cases of drug-resistant epilepsy, the preferred clinical option is a neurosurgical intervention where they'll cut out a bit of the brain tissue which is uh, generating the epileptic activity. And as part of the evaluation before they do this, the neurosurgeons will place electrodes directly on the surface of the brain, not on the scalp, but directly on the surface of the brain. And they give the ability to stimulate the brain directly by passing an electrical current through the electrodes. Mm -hmm. And this is actually important clinically because by stimulating the different parts of the brain with those electrodes, the neurosurgeon can work out where they are in the brain and can make sure that they cut out the right bit and don't cut out the wrong bit. So it's for patient benefits, clinically justified. Now, in the process of stimulating the brain as part of this uh, pre-surgical evaluation, Itzhak Fried noticed that when he stimulated in a part of the brain called the supplementary motor area, which lies immediately in front of the bits of the brain which actually control mm. the uh, muscles of the contralateral side of the body, sometimes the patient would say something, the patient is completely awake throughout the whole procedure, That's I should say, because the brain has no pain sensation, so this doesn't hurt at all having this brain stimulation done. The patient will say something like, I feel an urge to move my right hand or I think I'm about to move my left foot. So they'll experience something which sounds, from the way they describe it, which is all we have to go on, like volition, like the experience of being about to do something or wanting to do something or having the urge to do and something. They have, and they have the urge, but they're not actually moving it. They're not moving. They're not moving at all. So the neurosurgeon is effectively making them experience will. So it's clearly not free will because they haven't decided to move and <laughs> the neurosurgeon has decided to make them move. Right. So it's not free, but it is something like will. And it can't possibly be a retrospective confabulation or a trick that their brain is playing on them because they've moved, because in this particular case, the person is not moving at all. They're just lying completely still and reporting what they feel. Mm. So this suggests that this particular part of the brain, the supplementary motor area and the associated areas in the frontal lobes, is perhaps the brain basis of our experience of urge, volition, or of what we're about to do. Now here's another interesting feature about the free data. When the neurosurgeon turns up the stimulating current and stimulates a little bit more through the same electrodes, then the person actually moves. Mm. And they move normally the same bit of the body that they had previously said they felt the urge to move. Right? So these urges are always what we would say somatotopically specific. They refer to a specific part of the body. Yeah. The patient wants to move their right arm or their their left shoulder, it's, it's always a particular action they want to make. So what this tells me is not only does this part of the frontal lobe of the brain give us the experience of intention or what we're about to do, but also the process of having that conscious experience is an intrinsic part of its normal operation in generating the movement of that mm. body part. Mm. So the conscious experience is almost like a, an element of the normal causal operation of these frontal parts of the brain in making us move. So that to me suggests that conscious will isn't just a, a trick, a stitch up, a, a confabulation. It really is an experience. It's not a story, it's an experience. Just in the same way that uh, the stimulation of the sensory parts of our brain, auditory parts and the visual parts will generate experiences. I think we have an experience of will, which is perhaps more like a perception. In this case, it's a perception of our own impending actions. And that, and that perception comes in between the beginning of the brain action 
and the actual movement. Yeah, I think it's just one of the things that the brain action does. So the, the, the activity of the frontal lobes of the brain plans our actions, moves our actions out of planning and towards execution, mm -hmm. actually drives the action forward, and gives us the conscious experience that we're about to act. So I think we do know subjectively and truly what we're about to do. So that's perhaps a slightly unfashionable op opinion in the field, which is dominated by the view that conscious will is purely an illusion. I think it's more like an experience. And an experience that has to have some benefit? So that's the question about what it's for. <laughs> so I think there's a very powerful evolutionary argument that if it didn't have some benefit, right. it probably would have died out. And we're working on trying to identify what the possible functions of the fact that we experience consciously what we're about to do might be. So what these experiments show is that we have an experience of volition as a consequence of the normal brain activity which prepares and then executes our actions. And that's quite difficult for all of the uh, recent work which has suggested that conscious will is purely a retrospective illusion. It's quite difficult to explain on that retrospective account. Mm. But I think there's a bit of an asymmetry going on here because in neuroscience, people who work on vision, mm -hmm. that they all accept quite readily that activity in the visual areas of the brain generates a visual experience. That's not particularly mm -hmm. controversial. And I think that we should be very open to something pretty analogous in the frontal parts of the brain that plan and prepare and trigger our actions. Maybe they generate an experience too, but an experience of the action that we're about to make. So why this asymmetry? Why is it that we're happy to say that the visual brain activity generates visual experience, but many people seem to think it's neuroscientifically problematic to say that the frontal motor parts of the brain generate an experience of impending action. And they try to suggest that maybe the experience of what we're about to do is just a retrospective stitch up. But I don't see why we need to have that asymmetry. Well, I can understand why they want to do it because there's a, there's a, uh, a sense that, that volition is too close to consciousness and consciousness is something that some people would like to see eliminated. And so there's a difference between the sensory experience, this, is the, this would be the, I think, the subconscious feeling, that there's a difference between just the sensation of vision, which is a sensation, and volition, which seems to want to involve consciousness. And so if you want to eliminate consciousness, you can keep the perception of vision, but you're nervous about volition. Okay, so for, first of all, I'd say there's nothing wrong with eliminativism per se, because Science has to try and find simple explanations. Right. That's the principle. Truth of is truth. So, truth. Truth is truth. Is truth. Right. Whatever it is, if you want to eliminate it or not, but, but people have a, yeah. a predisposition to want to do it for maybe other motivations, but the science is the science. So, uh, and I think there's no doubt that some retrospective readjustment of our stream of consciousness does occur, and it does occur for our voluntary movements just as it occurs for everything else. But I think there's quite a lot of scientific evidence that there is a genuine experience of what we're about to do, mm. which occurs as part of the brain preparation that makes us do it. So it occurs in real time. And I think we need to be open to thinking about conscious will roughly in the same way that we are open to thinking about conscious visual perception. I don't think we need to have different standards for the two.